Hey friends, welcome back to the Sinai to Zion study. We're now in session 20. We've been, uh, throughout the past few sessions, we've been discussing Israel's last days, national salvation, her restoration to the land. We've looked at multiple passages throughout the prophets. Now I want to look at the prophet Zechariah, as well as in the New Testament, look at the words of Paul, again, as Paul understood these things. Now what's important to emphasize with regard to Zechariah is that he was a post-exilic prophet, which is to say he was one of the prophets that was after the exile. Okay, so Daniel, Ezekiel, I mean, Isaiah was prophesying, warning Jeremiah was prophesying right up to the Babylonian invasion. And then Daniel and Ezekiel were prophets actually during the exile. But then after the return to the land, you had Zechariah, which means this. He was one of the later prophets. And so he had the benefit of looking back and being aware of an understanding and being able to study all of the previous prophecies in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, etc., and a handful of the other minor prophets. And so it's amazing the degree to which, on some fronts, Zechariah, he's sort of like the, um, the whipped cream on top. You know, he's the crown, and he, he draws from so much of the imagery the story that the previous prophets were telling, but he expands upon it a bit. So beginning in Zechariah 12, verse 9, through chapter 13, verse 2, it says, And in that day I will set about to destroy all the nations that have come against Jerusalem. So the context is clearly the gathering of the nations against Israel in the last days. That is the playing out of the covenant chastisement cycle, the, the covenant chastisements. And then the Lord says this, and I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So very specific. He's not talking here about Guatemala or Argentina or Canada or New Zealand. He's talking about the citizens, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Very geographically centered statement. He says, I will pour out on them what? The spirit of grace and supplication. The spirit of grace and repentance, remorse. Now, we've been talking, again, looking at multiple texts that speak of Israel's turning to the Lord, him pouring out his spirit. When does that happen? Clearly, it's in the context of the return of Jesus, and Zechariah actually describes it. So he, pour, he says, the Lord will pour out his spirit of grace and supplication. Here it is. So they will look upon me whom they have pierced. They will look upon the... The Jewish nation, which has rejected Jesus, they've rejected the historicity of the cross, of the crucifixion, of the resurrection. They will look upon, the Lord says, they will look upon me. Okay, Yahweh, Yehovah, however you want to say it. He says, they will look upon me, the one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So there's repentance, there's remorse. In that day, there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem. He goes on very specifically. The house of Nathan, the house of Levi, the clans of David, etc. The land will mourn, every family by itself. Um, there will be a fountain that day that will be opened for sin, to purge sin. I mean, here it is. It's describing the cleansing of their hearts on a national level. All of the families together will be purged. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. They will no longer be remembered. There is no longer going to be Boo-Jews or Hindus or idols in the land. They will all worship the Lord because he's going to pour out his spirit. Repentance first, salvation comes with that. Spirit of grace and, su and supplication. I will remove the prophets and the unclean spirits from my land. We've looked at all of the different prophets. Now we're going to look at Paul. So Paul in, Ch in Romans chapters 9 through 11, he really gives an incredibly comprehensive theology of Israel. Now, as Peter later says, some of the things that Paul says are difficult, which the unstable uh, distort to their own destruction. Just because Paul is very thorough doesn't mean the church understands it necessarily properly or always gets it right. But I think when we look at the foundation of the prophets, it's easy to see what Paul was talking about. So Romans 11 verses 11 through 12, and then we're going to skip forward to verses 25 through 27. Paul says, I say then, they didn't stumble as to fall, did they? He's talking about his countrymen, the Jewish people. He goes, like, they didn't go down for the count. 
okay, to use a boxing analogy, they didn't go down permanently. They did go down, but they're going to get back up because they didn't stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. Absolutely not. He says, but their transgression, their sin, through their sin, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Very strange way to do it, Lord. I wouldn't have done it that way. In order for the Gentiles to get saved, you allowed your people to temporarily fall, to temporarily stumble, to be partially and temporarily hardened in order that all of the crazy Gentiles could come in. He says their transgression, the gen because of their transgression, the Gentiles have come in to make them jealous. Now here's what's interesting. Paul here is referring back to Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. Paul is expounding upon that which the prophets very well understood, which is there in uh, Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses. We've looked at it already. The Lord says, because you, my people Israel, because you've provoked me to jealousy and anger with your idols, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise up and through the lips of a foolish people, I'm going to provoke you to anger and jealousy. The Gentiles, that's us, that's me. Okay, if you're watching this, if you're a Gentile, the Lord has ordained that he would use us to call them back to faithfulness. It's a, it's a very strange dance. It's a very strange way that he did it, but it's exactly what Paul says. And he says, and if Israel's sin actually resulted in the Gentiles come in, riches for the world, he goes, can you imagine how much more will their fulfillment be when all of Israel gets saved? Can you imagine what that's going to be for the world? And he says, listen, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant I don't want you to be uninformed of this mystery. Now, ignorance is normally fine. I'm ignorant of way more things than I'm knowledgeable of. We all are. Ignorance is not a bad word to me. But Paul here says, with regard to ignorance concerning Israel, it's a bad thing. Don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant of this mystery that was not clearly revealed until Paul's day so that you won't be arrogant. You won't be wise in your own estimation. You won't be conceited in your own eyes. He says, listen, it's, this is the Lord. The Lord allowed a partial hardening to take place in Israel until it's a temporary partial hardening. It's a partial hardening, and it's not permanent. Temporary and partial. Until what? The fullness of the Gentiles come in. And so all Israel will be saved. At a particular moment in history, at a particular time, all of those that are left, all of those that remain, as the prophets have described, at the time when Jesus returns, when they look upon the one they have pierced, at that moment, Paul understood Zechariah. That's when all of Israel will be saved. All of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, yea, but all of the Jews globally, just as it is written. And then who does he quote? He quotes Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21, which is a passage that we read just a few sessions previously, which describe the new covenant, which then follows with an incredibly beautiful description of the millennium. Isaiah 60, arise and shine for your light has come and all of these things. The deliverer will come from Zion. Paul makes this argument. He goes, of course all of Israel is going to get saved. Otherwise, how are all the words of the prophets going to be fulfilled? He quotes Isaiah. Yes, the deliverer. Jesus will come to Zion. The redeemer will come to Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Israel will be purged. They will be his. Paul goes like, of course. The prophets have said this a thousand times. They've, they've reiterated this so many times. Of course this is going to happen. And then he ends it. This is the covenant with them when I take away their sins. And so then I'm just going to read the last three verses of uh, Romans 11. Because here's the thing is so much of the church misunderstands Romans 11. They go, what does it mean that all Israel is saved? And they go, well... Israel actually refers to the church, and like they have all kinds of ways of twisting things around. When you look at what Paul is saying in light of what the prophets, again, repeatedly, consistently state, it's clear. And that's the very reason that Paul breaks out into rejoicing and singing, because the popular preterist or replacement theology interpretations that many people have for Romans 11, like it's not really talking about Jews, it's talking about Gentiles because we're the new Israel and this type, like those, th those are not... Um, interpretations that are worthy of celebration. 
They're so, it's just, you know, it's so um, anticlimactic. But no, Paul lays it out and he goes, guys, it's crazy. This dance that the Lord's done, he causes Israel to be partially and temporarily hardened. They fall, they stumble, but not permanently in order that all of the crazy Gentiles shall come in. And then the Gentiles themselves are actually going to make the Jews mad by telling them about their own God, their own book, their own story. And these, the, through the lips of a foolish people, they're going to be provoked to anger. But then when they ultimately all get saved, when Jesus returns, it's going to be like life from the dead, riches for the world. Like, that's such a crazy thing. And then Paul just breaks out into rejoicing. Verse 33, he goes, oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Like, again, I wouldn't have done it the way that the Lord chose to do it. But the Lord is wise. The Lord has this beautiful, poetic romance, this dance that he has ordained at the end of the age that will lead to the maximum number of salvations. Paul says, who has become the counselor of the Lord? And who has given to him that he is responsible to pay the Lord back? No. He says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. He alone. He is the ultimate source of all wisdom and beauty and poetry. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul ends it with this just celebration and rejoicing in terms of the majesty and the mystery that's unfolding with the Lord's plan. When all is said and done, Israel will be saved, and that is reason for celebration. So amen and amen. Um, we'll jump in in the next session and begin to discuss some of the passages that are commonly used uh, or claimed, I, I would say wrongfully, to apply to the most recent restoration of the state of Israel. And we want to look at those in a bit more in depth just to show that they're actually talking about the last days. So amen and amen. God bless you all. Maranatha.